Amali Wright, um, Director of Landscape or Director of Landscapeology from Brisbane, Australia, um, has the best title talk of the morning, confident, confidently doubting towards the future. Um, Thanks. G'day, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Okay. Okay, so when I was a kid, I used to go to piano lessons with Mrs. Brock. Um, Mrs. Brock lived around the corner from our place, and the piano was in the living room where the curtains were always drawn really tightly shut. Um, in the middle of the regular furniture, the armchairs and the sofas and whatnot, there was a plastic fold-out banana lounge. Uh, when I arrived for classes, I would start by playing the pieces I'd practiced over the week. While this happened, Mrs. Brock would stretch out on the banana lounge in the darkened room and slowly smoke cigarettes. <laughs> I thought she was impossibly glamorous. Um, so this all made a huge impact on me as a child. I remember it really clearly, and I remember being very aware that I was having an experience that was quite unlike my other piano-playing friends. But as I didn't become a chain-smoking pianist, it's probably fair to say that it had no discernible impact on my career. Uh, but three other things definitely did. The house I grew up in was next door to the Sugar Research Institute. I grew up in Mackay, a sugarcane town. Uh, and it backed onto cane fields. Right beside us, there was a dip in the ground that filled up when there was rain. Uh, it's known in my family as the lake. Uh, and it's still the standard unit of measurement that my mum uses in describing how much rain has fallen. It's a bit of a sliding scale, and it kind of ranges from, so, how are things going, mum? Oh, it's been raining all day. We don't even have a lake yet. Uh, right up to, gee, it looks a bit wet up there. Oh, yes, Rusty, the dog, hasn't been able to go outside for days. And the lake's right in under the house. So we lived on the main road. And across from us was a, this lagoon system, and next to that was a water treatment plant. Number two, as well as that house, we had a beach shack. It was made from tree trunks and sheets of fibro. The floor inside was a whole series of triangular panels, which had came, come from old cane train bins. The floor had been painted yellow. The people who owned it before us had then painted it green, but they hadn't moved any of their furniture, so the triangles were decorated with this strange overlay of green and yellow shapes. Um, there was no town water. The kitchen sink was fed by a rainwater tank. To have a shower, you had to go outside and prime the pump. This was a, a complicated process involving spanners and containers of oil and much rigmarole to get the water from a bore into a header tank, which then went across to the shower, which, where it was heated by a simple but very potentially life-threatening electric current. The bathroom was just an old slab of concrete that was wrapped in corrugated iron, and there were to cane toads the size of rot wheelers clustered around the drain hole in the corner. Making up for all of this was the fact that across the road was the beach. And number three, my dad was a draftsman, and I remember being told a lot that the first town plan for Mackay had designated a whole swathe of land as unsuitable for housing because it was low-lying and flood-prone. Despite the recommendations of the plan, the land was indeed developed, and as night follows day, it was regularly inundated. Now, at the time, I took all of these things for granted. It was just the way things were. And it wasn't until many, many years later, and maybe I'm a bit thick, um, that I realised just how much water had formed a constant and a constantly changing backdrop to my life. Uh, so while we're on this trip down memory lane, who remembers the 80s? It's crazy, right? How else do you explain something like this? <laughs> or whatever the hell it is that's going on here. <laughs> so this was one of our top grossing movies. It was about blokes with big egos in big planes going at big speeds. <laughs> this is what we watched on the telly. Big teeth, big shoulder pads, big hair. Speaking of big hair, there's a music we listened to. This bloke was the prime minister of our country. <laughs> He was in the Guinness Book of Records for being a big drinker. <laughs> Out in Ipswich, big things were also afoot. 
But rather than big hair, this involved big concrete. Ipswich had big plans for small creek, a meandering chain of ponds flowing through degraded pasture land. This is what it looked like in 1946. In the early 1980s, the creek was straightened and neatened into an efficient concrete drain. Nearly two years ago, the local council began a project to turn that drain back into a functioning waterway. Landscapeology and our project partners, Bly Tanner, have been working with council on the latest big plans for Small Creek. 1.6 kilometres of drain will be naturalised over the next four years. Stage one's nearly finished on site. This is a career highlight for everyone on the team. It's absolutely what we signed up for. We think we're doing a really good thing. And yet. The conference theme seeks to define the elements that are necessary, possible, and inspirational for our cities today and in the future. 30 years ago, everyone involved in commissioning, designing, and building that concrete drain thought they were doing what was necessary, possible, and inspirational for future Ipswich. But, like Goose's moustache, were they totally wrong? Will people look at our project in 30 years' time and think, what on earth were they thinking? <laughs> so define the elements that are necessary, possible and inspirational for our cities today and in the future. The very act of considering such a question requires us to constantly travel this continuum between hubris and humility. On the one hand, we all deal with things called master plans, but the, on the other hand, we work with so many things that just can't be controlled. When I started school, I had a tablet, like many kids these days. But my tablet was a slate with a slate pencil and a little jar of water with a manky sponge that you used to clean the slate. I couldn't have imagined an iPad if you'd given me all the mixed lollies in the corner shop. So how am I to know what's necessary and, and who am I to say what's possible? For my sins, I'm also an architect, and I go to the architects conference every year. Each year, speakers talk passionately about the next big thing, the thing that will save the world, the thing that will finally demonstrate that architecture can save the world. The last few years, it's been 3D printing. According to some of the presentations I've seen, 3D printing holds the key to resource scarcity, housing affordability, and uh, emergency shelter. Another architectural thing that can save the world has been parametric design. Let's not forget shipping containers. We all believe that our thing is what's necessary. But what about my tribe? I'm often hearing landscape architects pres prescribing, we need more nodes, more nodes, whatever they are. <laughs> we need more engagement with stakeholders, whoever they are. <laughs> we need more activation. If this is the answer, maybe deactivate me now, please. Because we really love to be certain, don't we? We love to think that we have the answers to what's necessary. Let's hop back across the ditch for a moment to West Island. So here's Queensland, my home state. Down in the corner is Brisbane, the capital city, which is where I live. Off to the side is Moreton Bay with its three barrier islands, Moreton, North Stradbroke and South Stradbroke Islands. If you start out in Moreton Bay and keep turning left, you can go up the Brisbane River, left into the Bremer River, left again into Deben Creek and then branch off into the concrete uh, drain that is Small Creek. It's pretty small. Ipswich is Yagara country. It's the traditional home of the Yagara, Yugaral and Ugarapul people. Ipswich is the oldest provincial European settlement in Queensland. It became a really rich mining town, a web of old mine shafts and tunnels run under the city and occasionally something like this happens. It has many beautiful, incredible buildings that were built with the mining money and more than 6,000 heritage listed sites. It's baking hot in summer, freezing cold in winter. And since settlement first began, Ipswich has experienced regular and significant flooding, particularly in its downtown area. It's also one of the fastest growing regions in southeast Queensland. When the RFP for this project came out in 2016, Landscapeology and Bly Tanner teamed up and pitched an idea to council. Given that the project would have an impact that extended much beyond its official 11.8 hectare site boundaries, we thought, what if we just sat under a tent for a week and listened to what people had to say? What if we started with blank sheets of paper? 
and just tested ideas as we went. So the result was design your creek week, and that's exactly what happened. We did set up on site for a week, and lots of people came to tell us their thoughts. We did radio interviews, we met with the local councillor, talked to lots of people from the council, and started to meet the locals. This couple came with a folder full of photographs of birds that they'd spotted and had been observing all around the region and through the corridor. This is Robert. He lives down the road and he brought photos that he'd taken over his back fence back from the days before the concrete drain had even been installed. Information that we couldn't have uh, received even if we'd sat at our desks Googling for the rest of our lives. Uh, this family came after school on our first day talk to us and then the kids all went home and wrote us a letter asking us to consider some of their ideas. We had a people's day on Sunday, a couple of model creeks set up where the kids could play at being fluvial geomorphologists for the day. <laughs> we had a crafty corner where they made fishing lines and pretended to fish. We did netting down at the confluence of Deben Creek to see what, if anything, was already living there. Of course there was a celebration of national cuisine. Uh, and there was lots of conversation about flooding. We had many, many conversations. Everyone left behind an idea or a comment. We had 80 kids from the local high school come along and work with us. They shared their ideas, workshopped and drew, and this fellow learnt something that we all know. It's really hard work being a designer. <laughs> We had guys from three different crew, maintenance crews within council. Uh, we did flood modelling, we met with the traditional owners. By the end of the week, we'd heard from nearly 200 people, run initial flood scenarios, produced an initial concept plan which we presented back on site in the drain. It was absolutely exhausting and I would do it again in a heartbeat. I reckon we all would. So yes, we had big plans for Small Creek, but where does such a tiny thing, it's called Small Creek after all, fit into the story of water in a place like Australia. I've started to tell you a bit of our story. The people who came along to Creek Week shared many of their stories. And the more you look, the more that you realise that water is at the heart of so many Australian stories. 70% of Australia's landmass is semi-arid, arid or desert. Ours is the driest inhabited continent on Earth. As a result, we all cling to the edges, and 85% of the population lives within 50 kilometres of the coast. The Rainbow Serpent is part of the belief systems of the people of Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory, but it's known to everyone in Australia. The Rainbow Serpent is associated with life-giving and fertility. When a rainbow appears in the sky, it's said to be the serpent moving from one waterhole to the next. When the water holes are empty during the drought, it's because the rainbow serpent has moved on. Drought and flood are frequent occurrences in Australia and becoming more so. Since the mid-1850s, a severe drought has occurred every 18 years. Six years ago, floods in Queensland affected more than 200,000 people. Despite these realities, the idea of the desert island has a powerful hold on the imagination. For Australia's first unwilling European settlers, though, the desert island was a prison and the water was the prison walls. For those deemed the worst of the worst, the island prison became triply so. As well as being sent to Australia, they were then banished to Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania, from where they went on to Sarah Island. In the pre-Federation years, the man from Snowy River was one example of the popular emerging national uh, literature and culture. And it told the story of a dashing young horseman from Australia's alpine region, the Snowy Mountains. The Snowy River is also home to Australia's largest engineering project, the Snowy River Scheme, a hydroelectric and irrigation project built over 25 years, includes 16 main dams, seven power stations, two pumping stations, 225 kilometres of pipelines and tunnels and aqueducts. The Snowy River Scheme directs water into the Murrumbidgee River and the Murray-Darling Basin. Murray-Darling is one of the most contested water systems in Australia. It drains around one-seventh of the country's land mass. It spans nearly three entire states and territories, parts of two others, and is the nation's most significant agricultural region. Its management plan 
addresses issues ranging from water quality and salinity to water trading rights, urban demands and environmental flows. And its implementation is the subject of ongoing debate and frequent abuse. It was the proposal to dam another river that led to Australia's most significant environmental campaign. The Gordon River in Tasmania was the planned site for a hydroelectric dam that would have severely impacted both the Gordon and nearby Franklin rivers. The stunning photographs by Peter Dombrovskis reveal the majesty of the Franklin to all Australians, and they were instrumental in the Tasmanian Wilderness Society's campaign. Once the dam was stopped, both rivers were UNESCO World Heritage listed. Also listed, of course, is the Great Barrier Reef, the world's largest coral reef system. Its managing authority has identified climate change as the reef's major threat. Significant coral bleaching and dieback have already occurred. An additional damage is caused by declining water quality due to sediment runoff, mining, the crown of thorns starfish, shipping, overfishing, and more. Yet the beaches and the tropical islands of the Great Barrier Reef are a beloved part of Aussie sun-loving culture, along with Bondi Beach, Byron Bay, Bells Beach, and countless more that start with other letters of the alphabet. <laughs> Tourists, like the locals, flock out to the edges, to the coast, with their sharks and their stingrays and their crocs and their jellyfish. And we all come to Sydney Harbour with its sandstone cliffs and the billowing opera house. It was even water that took out the protagonist of Australia's unofficial national anthem, Walsing Matilda. The swagman chose drowning in a billabong over capture by the authorities. And if we glance even momentarily at our near neighbours, we can see the impacts and future challenges of living with or near water. 2004 Boxing Day tsunami displaced 30 cubic kilometres of water and killed 230,000 people. In 2011, flooding in Bangkok killed more than 800 people and affected more than 13 million, 10 times the population of Auckland. The Maralea River in Manila is one of the most polluted in Southeast Asia. In Papua New Guinea, the breaching of a tailings dam at the Octeti Mine has caused ongoing environmental and public health challenges. Out in the Marshall Islands, this uh, US military installation, built at a cost of a billion dollars, is projected to be underwater within two decades. Also in the Marshall Islands is the Runet Dome, Runet Island Dome. Nearly half a metre thick of concrete built at sea level and it covers about 73,000 cubic metres of radioactive debris resulting from nuclear tests between 1946 and 58. And of course you all know the challenges facing New Zealand. Dunedin, for example, has more homes less than 500 millimetres above high tide level than any other New Zealand city. My town, Brisbane, is of course at some risk of increased inundation by 2100. These maps show the current day highest tide in dark blue and the predicted highest tide scenarios for 2100 in light blue. Let's not forget that 2100 is not some far-fetched way off in the distance time. We may not see it, but it's only 82 years away. It's easily the life expectancy of someone born today. So, yep, some increased impact in Brisbane, but it's nothing like the impact in my hometown, Mackay, where that light blue area in the centre is that part of the city that was said all, all those years ago should not be developed for housing. So how we manage water is critical to the story of this big desert island of Australia. So what's been the next chapter in the story of Small Creek? As I said, construction of stage one is reaching completion and the work on site is revealing some of the technical challenges and strategies of the design. The single biggest change has been the ongoing removal of that straight concrete ch channel and the introduction of the new meandering low flow stream channel. Currently the drain does one thing very well. It moves stormwater very quickly from point A to point B. Increasing the sinuosity of the stream by making it more wiggly has doubled the length of the channel. As the journey's longer, it now takes much longer for water to flow downstream towards Deeming Creek. Tens of thousands of plants have been planted and the extent of turf vastly reduced. 
So in the current channel, the water moves through very quickly. If we keep it the same size and just plant it up, it slows the water down but increases the water level, which has a risk for flooding for the adjacent homes and properties. So we've had to make more room for that by increasing the size of the channel. So the design re-engages the floodplain by creating a small meandering low flow and a benched overbank floodplain. For the majority of the channel, the floodwaters are going to be slowed by more than half. The planting design includes nine planting types that respond to different expected water velocities, provide habitat and create different planting characters. Small Creek is part of Queensland's regional ecosystem 12.3.3, which is a eucalyptus teratocornus woodland on quaternary alluvium soil. This is a bit of remnant uh, ecosystem of that type elsewhere in, in Ipswich Council area. We were also provided with a species list by the traditional owners. Some of these are not widely grown uh, commercially, so they're being grown on now and will be uh, installed later as supplementary planting. A wide variety of water reeds and sedges were also nominated, and we've used those throughout. Some of these species are used for mat weaving, and so at the request, we've incorporated a mat weaving uh, area where classes can be held using uh, um, materials that are harvested on site. Both banks of the channel are fully vegetated, with trees planted to achieve a fully closed canopy. And as well as making the place more comfortable for people, full shade reduces the ability of typha to colonise the waterways. Each plant type includes a mix of trees and ground covers or shrubs, shrub spe or grass species. Pardon. The shrub planting is limited, both because it's sparse in this regional ecosystem and also because in a publicly accessible place, which this will be, it will enable clear views under the canopies once the trees are established. The vegetated channel will also improve water quality. And within the limits of modelling, it's estimated that the project's going to reduce pollution entering Deebing Creek and then the Brimmer River by the order of 108 tonnes per year reduction in total suspended solids, 149 kilos a year reduction in total phosphorus and 860 plus kilos per year reduction in total nitrogen. Why is this important? So this aerial photo, which was taken by NASA, shows the sediment plume out into Moreton Bay that occurred after the 2011 floods as it came from Ipswich, down the Bremer River, through the Brisbane River and that out into the bay. So managing sediment through all the work we do on construction sites and ongoing management of projects is really important for the waterways. So we talked a lot about water and plants, but of course the hope is that these in turn become places for animals. The low flow is punctuated by two wetlands, rocky riffles and chutes. The rocks have been very carefully positioned to allow the fish passage, fish passage upstream. And the, de the construction deliberately started down at the confluence so that those connections can be established and then increased as the work progresses upstream. This is obviously all very new and raw. These are only from a week ago, these photos. Um, the bird population is really starting to increase on site. In fact, it's so popular it's causing a problem that they're coming along and eating some of the, the grass plantings um, in the afternoons. Uh, and the dominant um, eucalyptus teratocornus will grow into a large hollow forming tree that's really important for a lot of the fauna species. Of course, two-legged critters are also encouraged. As well as the mat weaving area, there's a yarning circle for gathering and storytelling, informal tracks, a new cycle path, and lots of opportunities to get right down to the water's edge. And even though that concrete drain is disappearing, it's not going too far with all the concrete being kept on site and reused. So yes, we have big plans for Small Creek, but as for the elements that are necessary, possible, and inspirational for our cities, well, in some ways, that's both the hardest and maybe the easiest thing to answer. Back when I was at uni, everyone had a mate who was enrolled in first year psychology. Um, we'd all tag along to a few lectures in the hope of dropping in on a mythical beast, the lectures on human sexuality. We went along hoping for something like this, but instead we got something and someone infinitely better, someone we've already met this morning. This fellow on the left is Abraham Maslow, who developed the well-known hierarchy of needs. Our needs at the top of the hierarchy, hierarchy are important for the development of our personality, but they can't be met if the needs lower, lower down have not been satisfied. And I've been thinking about this a lot, both in relation to Small Creek, 
other projects and to this conference theme. Is what's necessary for cities in the future just what's necessary for future people? And is that the same as it has been, as it is for people now? And is that the same as it has been since we first walked on the planet as homo sapiens? Is what's necessary for future people, oxygen, clean water and sustenance, the physical requirements for human survival, some protection from the elements, clothing and shelter, a sense of safety and security, a sense of belonging, friendship and family, a need to feel self-esteem and self-respect, a need to realise our potential and so on. It sounds simple and you might think I'm being glib, but I do ponder what might a world be like if we gave top priority to things that future people most need. Oxygen, clear air, clean water, sustenance. And one thing that's interesting about this approach is even though it starts with what people need, if we can achieve those goals without sacrificing the needs of other plants and critters. Clean air, it's good for all of us, it's how the planet breathes. Clean water, it's the same thing, it's good for us all. Sustenance, possibly the same. This is a loaf of bread from Pompeii. And whilst not living in the path of an active volcano is also a very legitimate need, let's focus on that idea of sustenance as one of the physical requirements for human survival. Not sustenance as in a toaster that can burn your selfie onto a piece of bread. <laughs> How did we come to this? Cultures all around the world once worshipped the tree of life. Now we worship the market. A tree standing in a forest is worthless, but if you chop it down and make it into wood chip that can be bought and sold, it becomes something that contributes to the economy, something that has value. And now we all tie ourselves in knots trying to demonstrate the economic value of the things that matter to us, soil, water, trees. I used to think this was a good idea and it used to really energise me. Yes, let's show those bean counters that our stuff matters. Once our stuff is on the spreadsheets, it will be valued. Once it's in the financial models, it'll be harder for them to cut it out. I'm not so sure it's a good idea anymore. For starters, models, economic or otherwise, they're not facts, they're just inventions. We treat models like sacred texts, when really they're just a way of telling a story. We try and make models more and more refined in the hope of presenting a truer picture of a, a situation, but there's one thing we can't model away, us. Only last year, the Nobel Prize for Economics was awarded to a clever bloke who is a key proponent of the idea that humans do not lack act entirely rationally. Imagine. <laughs> we don't save for our retirement. We pay for a gym membership in January and then stop going. <laughs> As humans, what we hold valuable often cannot be measured solely in terms of money. We're sentient beings. The primary way we experience the world is through our senses. When we go to a beach like Whitehaven here, we experience it bodily and sensorily. We taste the salt, hear the waves crashing, feel the sun on our skin. If we go to a rainforest, this is the daintry, we feel a sweat running down our bodies. We see the flash of a coloured wing. If we were all to step into the peat swamp forests of North Selangor in Malaysia, our first reaction as human beings, as homo sapiens, is not I wonder if the carbon sequestration potential really does represent 69.2% of the total economic value of this place versus 21.3% for the timber. <laughs> or think of it this way. This is Ben, our amazing client for Small Creek. Ben is great. We rate Ben big time. <laughs> this is his little girl, Evie, at Design Your Creek Week, and she now has a little brother. I've had a fight a few <laughs> chats with Ben this past while about Evie and Harry. At no time did Ben say, I'm so glad we had children because each time I look at Evie, I think each child that I raise constitutes a net benefit to society <laughs> amounting to $217,000 in 2009 terms. Therefore, the net fiscal externality of becoming a parent is thus positive and substantial. People have children, even though they know there's no guarantees, even though they know they'll have to learn to sleep on, survive on less sleep than they thought humanly possible, even though it means dropping the Nick Cave off your car playlist and adding in bananas in pyjamas. <laughs> they have kids because they desperately want to, they need to. And then what do those children need? Oxygen, clean water and sustenance, the physical requirements for human survival, some protection from the elements, <laughs> clothing and shelter, a sense of safety and security, a sense of belonging, friendship, family, community, a need to feel self-esteem and self-respect, 
and need to realise their potential. Look, I don't know much. My life is just a speck in time. My career, nothing. But if our little project at Small Creek can help provide something that Evie, Harry and all the kids who came along to design your creek week need and all the birds and the insects and the fish and the critters and the trees who will live there from now on, something that they really need, clean air, clean water, then that's really about as good a start as I can offer with regards to the elements that are necessary, possible and inspirational for our cities today and in the future. Thank you.